Luke 15, 11 through 32. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants, what was going on? Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed a fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fatted calf. His father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your love and your goodness and your grace. And we just ask for your presence to be in this place, Lord God, and that your hand will be on us as we hear from your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's say thanks to Sarah, Sarah Norris, for reading the scripture for us. We, um, it's an unusually long text to read um, in a church service, right? You guys are like, wow, this is a long one. Um, there's so many words on the screen. Uh, but we do that, I, I do that on purpose because for these three weeks, I want us to focus on uh, this story. And I want us to for those of you even for whom this is a familiar story, I want us to kind of get our heads and our hearts in it again. And for those of you for whom this is a new story, um, I want you to see what an amazing, incredible um, window that it is into, like we talked about last week, who God is. And so we're going to take a moment together and just kind of uh, unpack this just a little bit. We're in week two out of three in this series. And last week we talked about the Father. We talked about Jesus' ministry, um, that the context of this particular story was just as important as the content of the story. Because as he's telling this story, he is in the home at the table with some people who in some ways, it was scandalous for him to be hanging out with. And there were some others around there who were kind of uh, saw themselves as being the ones who could judge who was in or out and uh, trying to maybe give Jesus marks and, and uh, perhaps maybe give him a grade on what he, was able, what, uh, what he was doing and saying. And they were displeased with what was going on because Jesus, time and time again, found himself at the table with people that he shouldn't have been with. 
in the story that he tells then, it's in direct response, and it's meant to speak to both of these audiences at the same time. He talks to those who are lost, and he talks to those who are lost but still in the house, right? Uh, He's speaking about the son who leaves and the son who stays, both of whom have issues, right? Clearly from the story. The younger son in the story asks for his inheritance from his dad. And it would be very, pretty much tantamount to saying, Dad, it doesn't matter to me whether you're living or dead. Uh, you're dead to me, and I would like what you, what's coming to me as an inheritance. And he does so, and he leaves. In the story, he goes to a distant place, and he parties it up, right? And in that process, as he's kind of uh, just living the high life for that moment, I'm, I'm going to guess that things were okay for him. But sin has a way of devaluing and diminishing people. That's what it does. It has a way, and, and I don't know if this makes sense to you, but in my mind, I think it has a way of flattening, flattening us out. So our sin will ultimately reduce us to looking just like everybody else. And I find that to be a really interesting contrast that when you see people who are living in obedience to God, not just moral obedience, but the heart of Jesus as we've talked about, those people end up doing things and acting in ways and living in ways that are startlingly creative and good right? Unique expressions of creativity and goodness so that when we talk about, when we have a guy like Bob Muzikowski who gets up on stage and says, you know, hey, there, here's what we're doing and this is what our school has been. Let me tell you, that comes not just from somebody who has a, you know, a wild-eyed, I want to go and do something that nobody else thought I could do. It comes from somebody who is just living in obedience to Jesus and when that happens, creative, good, amazing things take place. Sin has a way of flattening us out, though, and reducing everyone to their lowest common denominator. The party ultimately ends. It always does. And when it does for the younger son, his friends abandon him and he's stuck, right? About uh, not quite two years ago, I think, there was something called the Fire Festival. Do you remember this thing? Uh, Some of you guys saw this in the news, but it was a big deal. It was a a luxury event, and it was promoted on social media um, by all kinds of different influencers. The Kardashians were on board. Some others were on board. And it was organized by Ja Rule, who some of you might remember uh, as as a hip-hop artist. And it was a $1,500 ticket cost to get into this thing. And it took place on a private island, okay? Food was promised by celebrity chefs, music by leading art. It was a big uh, music festival that was going to take place all on this private island. And so I asked the question when I, when I remember seeing this, I was like, what could go wrong when you trust your life to Ja Rule? I don't know. <laughs> what ended up happening, it was so poorly organized and planned that people were stranded on the island. They got dropped off on the island and they were literally stranded there living, sleeping in pup tents. This is not a lie. They were like sleeping in like pup tents and eating cheese sandwiches. That's what they had until they could be evacuated off the island. And so it was one of these moments where there was a lot of promising and very little delivery, right? And I think that's what happened to the young man. He had a, there was a promise maybe perhaps of a life that was going to deliver big. And what ended up happening was he got, he got stuck, right? And that's what happens when the party ended. He, you know, he had his entourage with him before. He had his squad with him before. But when the money ran out, his friends disappeared. And then this is what happens to him. He, the Bible says, Jesus t- tells us he remembered. He remembered his father. He remembered his father's house, and he remembered the life that he lived when he was with his father under his father's roof. And what seemed before to have been a burden, he now recognizes was actually a blessing. The fact that he lived under his father's authority turned out, he realized, to be a blessing and a source of life for him rather than the constraint that we talked about last week. I want to make a a couple of statements today, and for those of you who like to take notes, and I always appreciate that because there's no way that you could remember uh, a few of the things that I say. Most of you won't even remember hardly a thing that I say. Uh, You'll remember a song or maybe a story, and you'll remember that guy Bob for sure. But when when it comes down to it, I I think it's great to write some stuff down and take some notes. So I'm going to give you a few things so that you can keep score here. Number one, inside the heart of every prodigal is the distant memory of the father's house. 
Inside the heart of every prodigal is the memory of the Father's house. And I would say this, I believe that our whole world suffers from some sort of amnesia. The way I would like to describe it. Inside every one of us though, even though we have forgotten so many of us and it's so easy to do so, we have forgotten, but inside every one of us is the memory of the God who made us and who loves us. It's hardwired into who we are. There are moments where that memory gets awakened. Experiences that remind us of that memory. When friends love us in an incredible way, something comes alive inside of us, right? When, when we're amazed, I and mean, even something as simple as the beauty of a night sky, uh, that, that, that there's something that comes alive in us. When we're moved by the sacrifice of a hero or somebody who loves, and so we're, there's something inside of us that comes alive. And I believe that there's a, a, something is stirred, that memory is stirred inside of us of the Father's house. That feeling of being alive and full is almost always the result of some good thing that God has put in our path to remind us who we are and whose we are. Leonard Bernstein, perhaps one of the greatest conductors of the pa past several generations and maybe of the modern age, he writes in this book, The Joy of Music. I, I want you to, for those of you guys who can appreciate this, some of you are like not into classical music at all, but I, th I thought this was very fascinating. He said, speaking of his love for Beethoven, he said, Beethoven turned out pieces of breathtaking rightness. Rightness, that's the word. When you get the feeling that whatever note succeeds the last is the only possible note that can rightly happen at that instant, in that context, the chances are you're listening to Beethoven. I love how he says this. Our boy has the real goods, <laughs> the stuff from heaven, the power to make you feel at the finish that something is right in the world. There is something that checks throughout that follows its own law consistently, something we can trust that will never let us down. Isn't that interesting that a composer or a conductor like that would see in a composer like Beethoven something that makes them come alive? I really think that's interesting. God has put these things in our path all the time to remind us so that we'll remember. I think overall, and this is my own perspective, and I have some really brilliant friends who uh, I like to just kind of talk with, and, and, and you know, they, we've, we've talked this out. I think beauty is central to who we are as human beings. And I think that ultimately beauty betrays who we are, and by that I mean it, it, it reveals who we are and whose we are. If this life is nothing more than the chance collision of biological or material events, then the beauty of a new child or the love of a lifelong marriage or whatever other beautiful thing that you look at has no meaning at all. Nietzsche's blistering critique of modern secularism, of our day and age, was that it hadn't the guts to admit that cutting God out of the picture meant that life, death, tragedy, beauty, right, wrong, justice, goodness, and kindness, none of them have any meaning at all, is what Nietzsche said. Believe it or not, even though he wasn't on board with the Christian faith, I think that he's been an incredible advocate for the Christian faith by making that point. That's the program today, is cut God out of the equation. And in doing so, it has sent so many people on a, on a deep quest for meaning in the wrong direction. <laughs> We're looking for purpose, beauty, and goodness, but the further away we get from God, who is at the root of all of those things, the more confused we become. That's what happens. The answer, simply put, is a return to God. A remember, to remember, to return. We have problems of injustice, inequity, violence in our communities. God help us. And I really believe nuanced, careful, critical thinking is required to be able to solve those problems. But if we don't first humble ourselves and turn back to God, then it's almost like all of our thinking and debating and legislating and policy making is just going to leave us groping in the dark for something that we can't find without him. We as God's people, and I speak to us here as God's people, we as God's people have to remember that, that we have an advocate, the Holy Spirit, who is all the time stirring up the memory in people's hearts of God. And if you and I are skilled, we can speak to that memory. We can act in ways that 
make people think, well, there's something really good about that, and I can't understand why. I, I mean, I recognize it as good, but why is it good? I really think that that's important. The young man remembers, and he turns around. He turns around. He's going to go home, and it was, a, it was a risky move for him to go home. He had offended not just his family, but he had offended the whole community, which makes the next part so amazing because when he returns, Jesus says the father runs out to meet him, and he stretches out his arms, and he covers the boy. Some scholars say that Jesus included that detail because it would have answered the question, why didn't the community stop the son from getting home? Because the boy had squandered and wasted all the father had worked to give him, but here the father is protecting him because that community would have understood their responsibility was to punish that young man. Either to beat him severely or to kill him for the offense. And think of that, the father running out at the first sight of him and covering him almost as if to say, no, no. I'm protecting him. He deserved to be punished, but the father covered him instead. And even more amazing is the fact that he gives the young man his ro a robe, new shoes, the ring, the whole thing. He, it wasn't just to get him dressed up for the party as if, hey, you, you kind of stink and, you know, we're going to have to, you know, get you a change of clothes if we're going to bring you in the house. It's not that your mom's going to be upset if you mess things up. It's not that at all. There was more to it than that. It meant that he was restoring his son to a place of sonship. Second point, God's mercy protects us from what we deserve, but God's grace lavishes on us what we don't deserve. Meaning we, des we might deserve punishment or judgment and God's mercy protects us from that, but it's God's grace that restores us and gives to us what we don't deserve and what we haven't earned. Jesus didn't just declare forgiveness, he declared restoration. He declared relationship, renewed relationship. The message behind his strange meals with sinners wasn't simply you're forgiven, it was I have kept a seat at my table for you in my house. And if you're here today and you wondered, we talked about it last week, you wondered whether or not that's true for you, it's true for you. It's not just that you can be forgiven, it's that you can be in relationship, that you, that you have a future, that you have a purpose, that you have a calling from the Father that roots you and puts you squarely in right relationship with him. Galatians 4, 7 says, Therefore you are no longer a slave but a son. And if you're a son, then you are an heir through God. Well, some of you say, well, then what about the daughters? I have a daughter. I was in a class one time where the professor was asking and it, if it bothered anyone made a comment, I think it was, about the language of sons and if, if the fact that that wasn't gender inclusive, if that offended anybody. And one young woman stood up, obviously from a different part of the world, and she explained how when the Bible talks about us as sons, how it meant so much to her. When it talks about you all are sons, it meant so much to her. She said, in, in my culture, just like the culture where Jesus, when Jesus lived, women were people with lesser rights, fewer rights, and so when the Bible calls me a son, she said, I'm not offended, I'm encouraged. It means I've been elevated to the status of an heir. Think about that. Men and women, young men and young women, you are welcomed back into the full rights and privileges of heirs of God. Think about that. That is grace right there for you. Ephesians 2, Paul says it like this. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace that you've been saved. And God raises us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Have you ever had anybody say to you, just put it on my tab? I love that. First of all, you should make sure they have a tab, right? <laughs> That's the best. Make sure they can afford whatever it is that we're talking about. Make sure that they can afford it. But if somebody says, hey, you go ahead, I'm going to cover it, that is a great thing. 
It means they can handle it. Don't you worry about whatever you spend, whatever you want to get off the menu. You get it, put it on my tab. That is the grace of God. Not only does his mercy wipe away our debt, not only does his mercy wipe away our sins through Christ, but his grace says, I've got a tab for you and I'll cover whatever it is that you need. That's why Christians throughout the centuries have risked everything to serve God and serve others because we are promised that when we do so, he's going to pick up the tab, right? That's why we can be wildly generous, wildly loving. That's why we can receive people and say, you know what? I love you in Jesus because I know whatever it costs me to do so, God is going to pick up the tab. That's beautiful. Jim Elliott somebody who impacted my life so profoundly as a, as a young man, he wrote this when he was a student at Wheaton College. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. In Luke chapter 19, just a, just a few chapters after our story here, we see another story of a man named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he, Right? For those of you who grew up singing a song like that, he was a, he was a tax collector, and he is one of the few people that has the, uh, you know, unfortunate legacy of being noted throughout the centuries as a very small man, right? Uh, you know, he's probably like, shoot, I already had a little man's complex. Now they wrote it down in the Bible, right? <laughs> But he was a tax collector, and because he was a tax collector, he was considered a turncoat. He, was a, he had betrayed his own people. He was wealthy, but he had gotten his wealth by stealing and cheating and conspiring uh, against others. And so he was hated by his own community. Jesus is coming to town in Luke chapter 19, and the Bible says that Zacchaeus, being a wee little man, climbs the tree, a, 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 a sycamore tree, to see Jesus, who is surrounded by crowds. And Jesus stops in the middle of what he's doing and points at Zacchaeus and says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. You're going to host me. I'm going to make your table my table. The religious types were offended, but when Jesus gets to Zacchaeus' house, Zacchaeus says, he, he announces to everybody, says, I'm going to give ha half of what I have, half of everything I have to the poor. And then, furthermore, if I have stolen from anyone in this place, I will repay it four times over. Think about that. Think about that incredible. Jesus comments at that moment. He says, listen, if any of you are wondering, I came here to seek and save that which is lost. We say it here at New City. We say we have an obligation not to the found but to the lost. This Zacchaeus was a prodigal son, lost not in poverty, Right? He was lost in his wealth, and it was the grace and the kindness of Jesus that changed him. Thirdly, the grace of God in Christ creates an inside-out change. <clears throat> religion is the contrast to this, because religion is an outside-in change. Self-help, outside-in. As a matter of fact, just about everything else that I know of is an outside-in change, and we're all familiar with that because we've all tried to do things that way. We're all on a program, you know, trying to create some kind of outside-in change. And this love of God, this grace of God that is ours in Christ creates something, does something different where it produces an inside-out change. And let me tell you, I've had the privilege of seeing it over and over again, dozens and hundreds and maybe even thousands of times now in the past 20-some years of watching and serving Christ. I can, I can tell you it is beautiful what happens when that grace of God takes root in a person's heart and all of a sudden, no matter what their experiences have been, no matter what their background is, no matter where they're coming from and I've lived in other cultures and spent time in different places and it is the same wherever you go. God works a miracle no matter what your background is, no matter where you're coming from today. That inside out change is yours as someone who is an, an heir of God in Christ. When we are humbled by the mercy and grace of God, it, something happens to us. We realize that we're sinners and that we're spiritually dead on the inside. And let me just tell you, you don't try to reform the dead. You have to raise the dead. And only God can do that. That's why this is not about how well we do, not, not about, about uh, whether we have checked off all the boxes of being a good person. That's not what it's about. The work God does in you and me is not a renovation. It's a teardown. <laughs> right? He said, 
I mean, think about this. He said, Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born again. He used that word must, not like you can be. He said, you must be born again. And that's not a new city thing. That's not a Catholic thing. It's not a Lutheran thing. It's, it's what Jesus told a very self-assured man of means who had asked him, how do I get into the kingdom of heaven? That's what Jesus said to Nicodemus. He said, well, all this that you've got going on right here, this is going to have to go. <laughs> and you must be born again. Now, that's a fascinating, that's a really interesting metaphor right there. And that is, I think, why it's hard for those of us who are self-assured or for the successful people in the world, people of status, it's hard for them to embrace the good news that Jesus preached because it cuts our success out of the equation. It says it's not really about what you've accomplished, and it's not even about how good a person you are. You can't depend on that. You can only depend on the grace and the mercy of God that is ours because of Jesus. It's not even about our church involvement, right? Most of us come to church and we say, oh, man, isn't it great I came to church? God must really appreciate me today. <laughs> but he doesn't. That's, not, that's, that's the wrong heart that we have. Jesus didn't die to get you and me to church. Amen. He died to get you and me to heaven. Amen. The only way to do that by his own words is to be born again. Have you been born again? I would ask, you can know for certain today. And I know this is one of these moments, if we were in a big, you know, I, I, I've spoken to, to in, you know, in places so much bigger than this, and, and it's great, you know, because everybody can feel kind of anonymous in a moment like that. And I can just say it out into the, but here I am just 20, 30 feet from you, <laughs> saying you must be born again, saying it's not about your status. It's not about what you've accomplished. It's not about if you've been a wonderful mother or if you've been a successful businessman. It's not about that at all. Because somehow when we're infected by that sin, even our good works can take on a very selfish end and a selfish aim. And so Jesus says to you and to me, all this that you've got going on, let's tear it down and let's rebuild. You can know for sure today that you have received that mercy and that grace of God. I have a friend who says it's as simple as ABC. The Bible says you just admit that you have sinned and that you have offended God, that all of us are prodigals in a sense. Secondly, the B, you can believe that Jesus took the punishment that you and I deserve and that because of what he did, we can have new life. And then thirdly, C, you can confess with your mouth and you'll be saved. And it isn't Jesus plus my church attendance. It isn't Jesus plus my offering. It isn't Jesus plus my good grades, Jesus plus my reputation, none of that. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. One of my favorite parts of the story that Jesus told in closing here is this moment where the son is like rehearsing his speech, right? And we get this picture, and, and Jesus was an incredible storyteller, and I just love this detail where he's like, he's strategizing when he goes home. He's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell my dad, I'm going to tell my I'm gonna, father, dad, I've sinned against you, and I've sinned against heaven, and I'm not worthy to be called your son. If you just take me on as a hired hand, I can pay you back. That's what he's implying there. And you can imagine him like, he's like, I know it's going to be a big moment. I've only got one shot at this, so uh, I'm just going to, he's like repeating it on his way home. Dad, I, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you and I'm not worthy to be called your son. You know, he's got, I got it right, I got it right. And he's like, got it memorized. And then he gets to, within the eyesight of the father and the father runs out to him, embraces him and covers him up and he starts his speech. And this is the detail that I love. The dad just ignores it. Like, I don't need your speech. <laughs> Get a robe. Get some new sandals. Put a ring on this young man's finger because this is my son. And I'm going to bring him in. And that's what Jesus did for you and me. He covered us. When we deserve punishment, he stretched himself out and covered us and said, I'm going to bring you in. I want to ask you to bow your heads with me for just a moment. And we have a moment here in our services where I just give an opportunity for those of you who say, just really simply, I need, 
Uh, I need to know for sure. I want to know for sure today I have been born again. And maybe you've been to church for a long time. That's okay. We said this is not about your church attendance. This is just simply about are you born again? Have you said, Lord, I want to receive your mercy and your grace, and I want you to tear this thing down and rebuild the way you want to rebuild things. If that's you today, and you say, I need to do that, I want you to raise your hand, and I'm going to pray for you right where you are. One, two, three. Just raise your hand and hold it up. Four, five, six. Is there anybody else? Praise God. Anybody else? That is so great. Let's, let's, uh, let's just pray together for, for, uh, for everybody here, for these six people who have raised their hands today. Father, thank you today because you have loved us in a way that is kind of outside of any other paradigm that we have. That's why it is so powerful when Jesus gives us this story. Thank you for this story and the way it just points us to your heart as our Father. And thank you today for these who've raised their hands. Lord, as we come together, Lord, and all of us here just very simply admit that we are sinners and we believe that what you have done for us is sufficient to wipe that debt away and to restore our account with the righteousness of Jesus, with the rightness of Jesus. Oh, Lord, we confess with our mouth today that we love you and that we believe that. And so, God, for these six precious individuals, I pray that this would be a new start and a moment today here on November 11th in 2018 that they'd be able to look at and say, that was the day that I, I know that I was born again. And the Bible says that if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. He or she has passed from death to life. And so, Lord, we rejoice with, with, uh, with these six individuals. We rejoice with all of us here today who have known your grace and your mercy now and, God, who are looking forward now to the life that you promised. Lord, continue to build us, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together and let's give God praise today. Praise God.